All right. Can you still hear me? Thank you. All right. Yep. Yeah, I'm recording this to the cloud. So we've gone through the clustering worker, the two models it has, contributor breadth worker, which looks at for all the people contributing to my project, what are the other projects they're interested in? It's the contributor repo table, contributor worker, which resolves identity for all the different emails and stuff. Um, that's what Anuj has proposed to do. So, so um, and so that contributor worker, I would say um, we should discuss Anuj with regards to the contributor worker. We should probably have a conversation about design for that. Um, so, what time zone are you in, Anuj? So, in IST five thirty. ISD, okay. 530 plus. IST, IST what? Um, it's the same as, it's, yeah, same, same as same, Drew. Same as Drew, okay. Yeah. yeah. And what time zone are you in, Yuming? Uh, let me see. Is it Beijing or? Yeah, it's Beijing. Okay. What time is it there right now? You mean what time is it there? Uh, right now it's 9, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Okay. Right wow. now. Okay. All right. So, um, So that's the the contributor worker. Um, we'll, we can we should probably set up some time to talk through that. But I think we want to think about like I can I can walk you through the design for it as it stands, and then kind of what we would prefer it to be. Um, and maybe we should set up a, probably I should set up one on one time with each of you this week just to make sure that your individual projects are off to a good start. Anuj, are you? So are you already set up on Augur? Uh, I did actually try, but like the system like didn't work for me. So I had to like install all of it again. I'm not sure about the exact process. So you, you haven't quite got it installed? Yeah, uh, the post uh GRE SQL isn't uh working for my system I don't know I tried reinstalling it also okay I can go over that with you yeah. um so, so and then there's the there's the GitLab workers GitLab issues worker GitLab two issues tables um and then there's the GitLab merge request worker, which is GitLab to PR tables. Um, then there's the insight worker. Um, this populates the um, Repo insights tables. And there's like a, this merge data stuff shouldn't be in there. <clears throat> Essentially, repo insights and repo insight records are two parts of the same coin. Essentially, what that worker does is it just does a anomaly detection for seven different chaos metrics like its PR issues, comments, etc. So it looks for unusual, it looks for disturbances in the force around a project based on a comparison with its own prior history. Um, and then there's the Linux badge worker, which is pretty straightforward. It just does the CII badging, which is very low, 
very low number, low, low percentage of projects use that, but it's still very important information for anything that's infrastructure critical. And then the message insights worker. Anyway, here. I guess it's it got freezed for him. Hi guys, by the way. Hey uh where are you from, Drew? I'm from Mumbai. Where are you from? Hi. Hi, I mean. I'm from China. Okay. Okay. That's great. How's the so, things yeah. regarding Corona? Sorry, my English is poor. Sometimes I can't get your points. Repeat. Oh, that, that's fine. <laughs> So we the only three people in this G I guess there are six people got selected. We three are working for Augur. There's also Yash, oh. Rashmi, and Ritik. They will be working for other things in chaos. Is he still in the meet? I think we should probably let him know. Hey, my computer crashed. Uh, okay. So, yeah, that's what I get for having the internet out and doing this on my laptop. Although nothing I'm doing here should in any way like cause a kernel panic in Mac OS X, and yet it did. So we're talking about the Linux badge worker, and uh, it's the LF uh, CII initiative badging. And the pull requests analysis worker, uh, it attempts to predict or estimate the likelihood that that new PRs will be merged based on a priority similarity with already merged and rejected PRs, basically. That's what that one does. Um, I think uh, training of this model needs to be optimized. I'm just like putting all the disclaimers on there for you. Um, and then pull request worker. Yeah, there's all the pull request stuff, which is by far the most substantial like there's uh, PR commits, PR files, PRs, um, PR reviews, um, uh, PR messages, Let's see the earlier sketch. Um, yeah, it's got like anything with pull requests on it is probably populated by that or one of the machine learning workers and it should be obvious. Um, 14, the release worker. Uh, yeah, there's the named releases in a repo. 
um, repo info worker. Um, it gathers repository metadata data needs a GitLab update for what it's worth. Um, so that, for example, we use this to validate the completeness of Augur's data collection. So anything that's crawling a bunch of APIs, you never can have total confidence that it's actually got all the data. Um, and so the best way to get that confidence is to have some metadata from a platform that tells you how much of everything is you're supposed to have. And so we just essentially run those tests so that we know how much of everything we're supposed to have in each case. Um, just so you know, 16 um, value worker. Um, reads the physical repository cloned by auger worker and there's a Kokobo labor calculation incorporates language, number of hours and complexity. So with that, um, if you just look at the, this is the repo labor table. Okay. Um, and if we just look at that real quick. Oh, there we go. So I'm just going to show you what the data looks like in here, because it could be interesting because essentially it tells you what repo, the analysis date, um, and the particular file in question, file name gives you the total lines, the lines of code, blank lines, move your faces over here, and then code complexity. So get down into some not trivial file sizes here. So this is a make file with a code complexity of 290, which is pretty high. Uh, stats.c file with a complexity of 390. So you can see that there is a substantial variation in the complexity scores um, based on how the algorithm evaluates the complexity. I'll say this after having worked with it for a year, a few years now, I guess maybe three years, that um, it's the, the algorithm is consistent it's not right. There's no canonical truth that it reveals about complexity and how long it would take to recreate a project and what the level of investment might be estimated at um, for a project. Uh, but it's consistent. So even if even if it's not always right, it's consistently wrong. Um, so if it's consistently overestimating .erl files, which are um, I don't even know what language that is, Erlang. Um, so if it's, you know, if it's overestimating the complexity of Erlang, it'll do that consistently. Um, but it does, it calculates complexity and counts lines for almost every language that I've thrown at it. I can't remember the last time it didn't do it. So it's a pretty good little tool, the value worker. And so that's the, that completes the worker overview of what we have in house right now. Um, I think, Drew and Yaming, you can see where you probably need to go for data. Um, Anuj, probably we have to do a little bit more discussion. Um, what do you all want to talk about? To, I mean, I think probably I should spend a little time checking on Anuj's setup to make sure he's what, figure out what's wrong with his configuration. Um, but Dhruv and Yeming, are there other questions you have before I dive into that sort of technical realm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one question. I have yeah, some questions. 
Sure, of course. So, are we cloning repositories and then analyzing it? So this is this is the um, so yes. So there's another way to look at each of these workers is where does it get the data from? Um, So the clustering worker gets its data from the issues and uh, table auger tables populated by issues and PRs. Um, um, this is readers identified by other workers. Plus plus get hub lab. API calls to get activity stream on all those for each contributor. So the contributor breadth worker is taking a look at each ID in the contributor table for a platform and making an API call to get the activity stream for that user on that platform then it's populating the contributor repo table. And from that, you can determine if there's a major contributor to your project that's starting to make a bunch of other contributions on other projects and that sort of thing, which can be useful, especially if it can be useful for a lot of things. Um, we have hardly tapped its utility. Um, the depths worker, as I explained, is very alpha. Um, this for the uh, data source, basically the facade worker cloned repos. Um, that's really what it's doing there. It's just scanning all the files. Discourse analysis worker is the same as up here. Um, facade worker. It's just a get clone, GitHub worker, data sources, GitHub API. Um, here, the data source is the GitLab API. So the insight worker is looking at already populated metrics tables. This Linux badge worker gets the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative badging program. Um, pull request analysis, oh, actually, pull request analysis worker. Um, Pull request worker relies entirely on the GitHub API. Release worker is the GitHub API. GitLab's needed. Uh, this is the GitHub API. Um, value worker, this is um, facade. Owned repos. And so it's basically, so you can see there's a few workers. There's two other workers that use the cloned repos that facade clones to scan through the depths worker and the value worker. Yeah, so the facade worker just clones it in a temporary directory and then removes it or it consistently keeps it. It's, it persists it. So the, the, the heaviest lift when you create a new Augur instance is getting the initial data populated. Um, and for facade, um, 
it does it pretty fast. Like I've done 7,000 repos in two weeks, like counting every commit on a server for the initial population. And then from there, it's just looking really for the diffs. So it goes much faster once you've done the initial population. Um, I've, I've also had it where if I'm looking at scientific repositories where they store some scientists are not super sophisticated about how they manage their computational models. And so there's a collection of them that use GitHub for that. And when I have to scan repos that contain very large computational models, you can imagine that the diffs and those diff calculations get extremely slow. So um, that's just like, if you find facades run, if you try to do facade on your own and you find it's really slow, is it like if it, if it for less than a thousand repos, it shouldn't take you like at the outside, assuming some kind of decent computer configuration, it take you a week for a thousand repos at the outside, like at the farthest reaches. And if it takes longer than that, chances are for the initial data population, I would say the likelihood is that you have some very large files, some very probably computational models that somebody's committed to the repo. Um, and I just think that um, Git tools are not sophisticated enough yet to skip those um, or to know how to treat them because they've been put into a version control system. So shouldn't I track the line by line discrete changes? Actually, no, they're kind of binary, but Git doesn't know any better. So it counts them. Hey, Lawrence, welcome. Hello. You are here with some Google Summer of Code students, and we've just been kind of like reviewing the workers. And Anuj has some questions about his Augur installation. Um, what brings you here, Lawrence? Uh, this is Lawrence. He's an active Chaos community member. Is there a workshop today? Yeah, that's what, yeah, we're workshopping. I just don't, until you showed up, I had the Google Summer of Code students only. So welcome. So this is more advanced than the workshop, right? Uh, I'm not sure. It depends on your question. I don't know. I was I was going to start from basics. Okay. I was, I was, I was under some I was going to go back and assume that my uh, that I did didn't have everything installed on my computer already, which I do have everything installed. But is it still not working for you? Well. I can no. tell you that I know that as of uh, last month, yeah. I still, my main problem was I still couldn't get a, I couldn't sign off on, on commits. <laughs> Literally the DCO, whatever that, the, the DCO, the DCO wasn't working for me. Uh, I couldn't do it on the web. I had to install the, down, uh, it, uh, it on to the GitHub onto my computer, mm -hmm. um, and then still didn't work. I was doing a thousand different things. I didn't know what I did, did wrong, but after about eight hours of over two days, I just gave up and had someone else sign for me. Huh? But that it's supposed to be so easy. Yeah, <laughs> I literally tried. And it doesn't matter. Is it uh, um, what 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 repo are you trying to make commits to? That was to to your one of the uh, chaos repo. Okay. I basically seen something in October. I I changed something, and I looked back and I'm like, okay, it didn't get changed. I why didn't the thing I spent two hours editing <laughs> get get uh, up and integrated? Which uh, which repo? Do you remember which repo it was? Oh, it, it, Resolved now. It's um. It was a okay a diversity repo. Okay. Um, when stuff like that happens, if you get stuck on sign off, and this could happen for any of you, you can message me, and oh. I can I can do a forced sign off for you. Okay. I mean, would have I didn't know it until afterwards. So I went to go review it because I I was going to use my chains for something else. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. And in the past, we've we've we do try to enforce that, and it's important. But especially when you're starting out, it's a bit of overhead, and it can be confusing, and it doesn't always work the way you expect it to. And if you're uh, not, you mm -hmm. so 
apply. And if you're, the other thing is it works the same way as reverting commits where if you've made a series of local commits, like 10 local commits or whatever in the course of fixing something, um, it wants sign off on every commit. And so it's like, then you have to go back and do the sign off on every commit if you haven't been signing off all the way. And it just ends up being um, a lot of work. So sometimes if you've got a lot of commits in something before you realize that you have this DCO issue, um, I can go in, I can go into the code, I can go into GitHub and fix that for you. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, the first time or two, because otherwise with all these chained commits that you have, it gets to be this tedious nightmare of signing off on each one of them in retrospect. Um, uh, not sure that adds a ton of value, honestly. So hello, uh, Google Summer of Code guys. Um, I have positive things to tell you guys about Google Summer of Code um, from a non-coder perspective. Um, I'm a survey guy and I just did a survey of maintainers and my survey of maintainers says that mentoring programs is the best, is the third best way, third best way. to increase uh, diversity of the, of, of the maintain contributor base of, of open source projects at, after just being having an open welcoming community and specifically having efforts to onboard and, and encourage people to get involved. But there is, it's pretty hard to actually have actual programs and efforts to, to get have mentor programs. So Google Summer Code is good, but you actually have to I think efforts to do that. Um, and the second thing is actually Another important thing is actually getting non-coders involved. And from that perspective, Linux Foundation hires hire someone to be in charge of their research projects. Yeah, um, yeah, Hillary. And, and she's been resistant to use GitHub to manage her the surveys because she doesn't, she doesn't understand how to use it. Mm -hmm. So when I'm trying to tell her first thing you need to do is understand how to use that the markup itself is a big deal you yeah markdown deal with the formatting she has trouble formatting google docs if you don't understand how to do the formatting in markup that's just yeah. not she's gonna spend all her time dealing with the formatting <clears throat> not even dealing with the the version control and uh, issues which are the bigger deal yeah so i'm trying to Deal with baby steps, and so for her, if she if she has to deal with multiple things, but yeah, but if just just in terms of markup, that's going to be an uh, that would be an obstacle for her. But in addition to that, it's the version control and the other things. So what I've done was that we were using Google Docs now for to track for for commenting, and then what I was doing was. I was taking the major changes one by one, making the changes and making commits. Is that for this for the to do group survey? Yeah. I, I was making commits with comments saying, this is the change I made. This yeah. is the change I made. So people could still see the track record of the changes that were being made compared to last year. Right. So that's the compromise mm -hmm. from the old, from dealing with people. Who aren't used to it, it but still having a, a track record and letting people have see what's going on and and still using and we use issues to some extent also for for people who are comfortable. That was a compromise that was made. That seems like a good compromise. Um, um. It, it's tough when people, I mean, I, I love, what I love about Git is that it lets you see all of the changes line by line. Um, it's extremely useful and it's extremely useful for survey people as well, because you can see what's different in this year's survey oh. very easily. So uh, it's, a <laughs> yes, it's, a and it's embarrassing when I have to make comments saying this question didn't work because I didn't code it in survey monkey. Right. So <laughs> 
um, we didn't actually publish the data because I didn't do it. I coded, I, I miscode, didn't enter something in. It's trans radical transparency. Yeah. Uh, which is um, unusual in this um, world. You 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 probably you know this, but yeah. But in the this in this world that I'm in, most people you could hide all the mistakes you make if you're if you're getting paid by PR people or vendors or etc. Yeah. Um, except for if you're try to um, uh, work by the same uh, standards and ideals as the as the, the industry and the, the people that you're covering and uh, working with. <sighs> Sorry. No, that's that's a uh, important insight for this team. Yeah. I think uh, it, <clears throat> it's a it's. Uh, so are, you, are you trying to get Augur running then, Lawrence? Or I don't need to get Augur running today. Okay. Um, honestly, I could get Augur running today. I was. I'd like to get Augur running eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what I really in the long run, six months from now, yeah. two months from now, <laughs> I want to be, have all the running to be pretty good using Python for data analysis and in Jupyter workbooks and data visualization and be able to um be collaborate with people basically be a manager of people who are doing data analysis okay yes that's honestly so 10 years ago i used to be managing people who were doing data analysis for me using sdss so i had that's how i learned how to do data analysis years ago and then i was basically managing the projects and i knew how to do everything myself but then i but i would um and i would go in and people to spot check and fix things because i knew how to do everything but then mm -hmm. i would be working on the reports but now then i when everyone went to start using r and python and everything else mm -hmm. i lost my skill sets yeah and, yeah yeah no, that's... so basically i put, and then i just i have to i want to pick up the skill sets again and i And I've, and, and yeah, I've used all the Google stuff, like get big query and everything else, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not good enough, and it's not good enough to do what I really want to do. And um, and that a couple of years, like a few years ago, basically I basically I said I was doing everything, and I, then I said, "Well, people up the tertiary are doing it better than me." So I'm yeah. going to stop doing it. <laughs> I'm going to let the Patergy people do it instead of me. Yeah. And I, so I still think that's the best idea, but um, I think this, I want to be able to step in and be able to do things ad hoc. And um, I mean, Augur's, Augur's way of storing data is definitely lends itself more to ad hoc investigation just because it's relational structure. Um, and it's, uh, and yeah, mostly because I don't want to rely on, I guess I've got, I don't want to have to rely on asking everyone else to answer the questions. Um, you, you saw the big thing that like, there was a big, um, so I have a lot of answers, questions, answers I want to ask. Questions you want to ask? Oh, no. I have I have research questions I want to answer, and um, and I don't. I was getting tired of copying Philly Papa's uh, stuff um, syntax on big for big query, for example, from years yeah. ago. That's what I. That's like from four years ago. That's what I was doing. Uh, or so. Um, uh, if you have a a, a, a list of repos or a set of repos that you're particularly interested in exploring this with you know they might be repos you know something about um, um, uh, uh, 
I can get you a database that has whatever repos you want in it. Oh, if, I don't even. Um, you can think about it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting questions. Um, all but. I am. What are the questions that are, that are coming up to you, to you guys? So one of the questions that I heard like two, two or three weeks ago in the chaos uh, weekly meeting was music was should chaos be helping with consulting projects? Like that's like a, what's the use case for chaos? Um, how should the chaos tool, tools being be used? Should it be overall general use, asking use for general, very big questions, overall introductory questions, or should be used for as a for, for more in depth type of answer answering questions. Um, and that more in depth type of answers is what I'm interested in. Um, that's but that's also not that's where honestly that's where the there's consulting money to be made. Mm -hmm. And that's not so, and that's where, so that's where basically either Detergia makes money or Chaos Foundation gets um, a sponsor. So basically say, hey, guys, can you just, so in terms of you guys raising money, you basically say, hey, can you guys sponsor a one day workshop? And at that one, work, one day workshop, you guys present the findings or you, you talk about the problem that this company has and that's how you solve that problem of of, of you you deal with that's how that company would basically get solve their problem and give you guys an extra fifty thousand dollars to to deal with the issue that's that's most pressing to this company um uh it it's a, it's a way to solve to deal with the to raise the money and solve the problem um, mm -hmm. and still be um, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, the, the issues that I'm seeing, so you guys are all, are you guys all, are you guys all in the United States? No, none of them are. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't think so. I didn't want to pre presume uh, I was basically, if I said, you, if I just looked at your skin and I guessed where you were, I would s seem like I was um, being um, racist or bad, a bad person. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's always good not to assume, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been writing about a lot is like where people are doing, where people live and how that affects their, where they're contributing. Um, and one of the biggest, and basically I've been writing about, are, are, are people based in China? Are people based in South Asia? Um, so literally I've written about Israel recently, um, China, uh, well, who are the top contributors in China? Um, who are mm. the, Stack Overflow just got bought last week. Oh, I didn't, um, I didn't hear that. Who bought them? Oh, Prosus, which is the owns a thirty percent stake in Tencent. And what's most interesting there? No, I don't know what those companies do either. <laughs> okay, so Prosus is a is a consumer is a invests in technology companies just like SoftBank invests in a bunch of technology companies, and SoftBank owns was in the huge investor in Yahoo Japan and. Um, that's the deal with that. So process process is owns like like ten percent stake in Mail. That are you um, owns thirty percent stake in Tencent, which is like Mail Chat, uh, WeChat, and um, a bunch of other things. QQ.com. I don't know what the exact how to pronounce it in in, in Chinese. Um, the they. Code Academy, all these other things, but they bought 
They put 100% stake in Stack Overflow. Um, what's interesting there is that in December, a, a Indian investor had put a, had put a big uh, private equity stake into it. And so they had gotten out they, because Stack Overflow, a huge percentage of their users are South Asian. Okay. Um, and Stack Overflow, still 48th largest web traffic in the, in the world in terms of uh, internet users. Yeah. Um, but not a lot of uh, users from China, um, depending on which way you look at it. Um, where am I going with this? Uh, I don't really know. I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, just uh, uh, probably answering tool, answering what questions can chaos answer. It sounds like certainly Stack Overflow is a major influencer in open source because we all search it to Ooh. figure out what the how to solve. So surely somebody's encountered this error before, and cool. inevitably that leads me back to Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange, one of the two. So yeah, and I'm looking mm -hmm. at Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange as one and the same, and there's ways yeah. to look at it together in terms of a combining the where the, tra where the traffic comes from either from either of them yeah. um and and basically what that thought was recently is that i don't think they've actually changed their api since 2014. okay that's uh, maybe i was wrong but when i was looking at over the weekend that's the, the terms of documentation this but they've changed the access to the API since then, like in terms of um, uh, what's it called? Um, to the number of API calls you get per hour. Yeah, exactly. For an authenticated user, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, limiting limiting it. And that's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, all the major platforms like GitHub and GitLab already limit theirs. So, um, and so, so Stack Overflow's Creative Commons, the, their intellectual property. It's supposedly free, but you can't access it anymore. So basically, just like with GitHub, with GitHub, the old stuff you could get access to, but the new stuff, how much can you get access to? It's it's much harder to get access to the old to the new stuff in, in terms of how fast you get access to it. You know more than I do about this, but it's, I mean, certainly, certainly, getting the data downloaded, the like getting the first round of data for a collection of repositories is the long pole in any auger installation um, because um, there's just a lot that's already there that we have to accumulate and you know it should for the most people who use auger it should take a week or less and you know i've had some outlier cases as i, I was mentioning i think when you came on the call or just so you know. and with that, so stack overflow it's mostly um the issue is that most of the good data is only so most of the 70 76 to 80 plus percent of the traffic from on stack overflow is from search itself yeah Not people who go there directly I almost never go there directly. I almost always get referred to it by Google. Exactly. And so it's basically, <laughs> and that's not, that's unlike anything else. Like, um, yeah. that, and so that's, so when you go there, you're not right. I don't know the answer to this question. I want to know. When you can't answer this, but when you go might, there, you actually show up as a registered user. You are not registered, probably not. No, I mean, I think I have a user account, but the reason I never log in is because their crediting system and the way that you get to be a user who can say thumbs up or thumbs down is it just seems overly structured to me and obtuse and like I don't even know where to begin. So it hasn't been important to me. No. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, so what? Instead of me doing this right now, since I've just had so much fun talking. Yeah. 
Min Min said that's what are these should these guys doing? You guys want sure. to Sure. Yeah. Um, Yaming, Drew, Anuj, why don't you introduce yourselves and kind of what your project is briefly to Lawrence? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So, hey, I'm Dhruv, I'm from India. I'm in studying in computer engineering. I'm currently in second year. And yeah, I'm working with Risk Working Group, which I would be developing a shared data resource focused on dependencies, risk, and vulnerabilities. And that's that's my plan for summer. What, what are you doing yeah. with dependencies? So basically, uh, we can, there's a lot we can make out from dependencies, basic, uh, it, it comes with its own, the freshness of dependencies, the vulnerability it has, if you're using it, the risks and just analyzing, just making a resource for that, using various tools like scorecard, libiers, and you can just make a nice, uh, a, a proper data resource, which could be like hugely uh, helpful in terms of analyzing dependencies for the project. Okay, I um, I know that for analyzing dependencies, I would there I would basically think about it in terms of I don't know about the coding aspect. I know in terms of think about it in terms of what people could do with the information you're getting. Can they take action based off of it? Um, once you know if there's a, like, can they make a change based off of the information you, they get? Or are they just going to say, oh, it's a risk? To, um, I'm scared. Or can they actually? make an upgrade um, that's or change in license or th those are the type of things that are important to be able to do. Um, just being able to create a report saying that there's a lot of risk is not always uh, helpful. Um, so that's just a small thing uh, besides that. Uh, I'm all I'm, I'm looking at codependencies all the time. It's a hot topic. Good luck. Yeah. Um, yeah. The risk working group. I don't know if you followed the risk working group's work, Lawrence, but it has a assembled a list of tools and minimum viable metrics. Oh, um, Michael which Stoveda, yep. might be um, useful to you. Let me okay, see I, have it. I'll... I can put it in the zoom chat. Here. I'll look at that. I haven't. I know. The, I I saw the people's name, and I um, uh, I got in trouble for criticizing the um, the like Google the Google tool that came out last week. What tool was that? Um, that. Uh, hold on. Um. um I don't even remember anymore. I'll yeah. find in a second. Um, uh, it was it was a good tool. I would just like I wish it was more for the thing. The open source insights project? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, mostly which was was fine. I'm like what it's uh, basically I thought it was what I wish it was more. That was what my what way was what did you think i just heard about it just now <clears throat> which um means nothing other than i just heard about it just now um no basically it's uh i have learned that companies like google and github operate using what's called a mono repository which it's kind of hard for me to get my head around because I've never worked in that environment. So, so does I like apparently they have just like one giant Google repository for all the Googly stuff. <clears throat> and then 
but how that's not very helpful. I don't know. Like, I don't like, I just, I've just been introduced to this concept of the mono repository and apparently it's, it's not just Google GitHub uses one as well. And I, I don't, I don't have a clear, I don't have a firm grasp of what that might, might be like other than it breaks all of my models for understanding version control in a large organization. Um, and there's that, um, the, what they, yep. what I, my takeaway is basically what they're, what they've created is pretty good for um, a visualization of the dependencies. So how, how do you visualize the, pet, the dependencies? And if you're trying to debug a project, that's good. You, and try to, I mean, de debug a specific application, that's good. Mm -hmm. But if you're an app developer day or working on things day to day, if you're an application manager day to day, mm -hmm. it's just not something you're going to use. Yeah. But if you need something for a toolkit, that's great. Or if you're <clears throat> if you're building a brand new application, maybe you can look at it. Or if you're doing audits of software, maybe. But it's not something that's um, going to be used day. To Day to day, um, the versus something like you've seen, like what's what's integrated into um, what Linux Foundation integrated into its um, dashboards for its projects with Sneak, which I thought that's I don't Sneak's got I don't know how they got a deal like that to for their marketing um, seems to be a little um. um not there. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> uh, here, let me find the link. Uh, now you're going to hear my uh, ditching. Um, uh, so You look at this. So it's code going back to it. Um, so through you'll see this is this has to do with a little bit with dependencies, it's just not about the specific code to find the dependencies. Um, so there's a And he uses chaos, chaos involved too. Um, so basically, all the different projects it has different metrics involved for each of the projects, mm -hmm. and you have to log into the project to, to review it, and then you can basically, and they scan each project and then. You log in use the sneak software they let you take action based off to address different dependency issues they identified interesting and that's because that's the state that's what they've been that's their core business um value prop that they've been selling for the last year and a half in terms of their software composition analysis product um and I know this because that's my job. He is um, <laughs> uh, do, doing in terms of competitive intelligence. Um, uh, it's so basically it's a little bit of a, and because people from Linux Foundation marketing went over work, started working for Sneak. So I'm like, that's how that happened. Um, sorry. Um, And Anuj, what are you working on? Uh, hi, sir. My name is Anuj. So I'm from India. 
Uh, I'll be like mostly working on like creating an API accessible graph database. So it's mostly about like mm -hmm. pip installing in the Google Code Six workers. Okay. Yeah. So, like I'm doing like there are multiple uh, email addresses, so I'll have to identify and map them uh, according to uh, the across the platform. Whatever they are. Okay. Um. And Yeming, is that, can I pronounce your name right? No? Yes, I think so. Yeah, his internet's not that great. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, it's my turn. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Yeming, uh, and I'm from China. Uh, um, my, my research lab is also do the similar things uh, like chaos, we want to uh, collect some data uh, from the GitHub or GitLab. And we use this data to uh, create some model and to analyze this. So, and we can get some uh, metric to help uh, company or communities. Yeah, that's uh, what my lab did. Uh, my proposal, uh, something about my proposal, uh, I want to uh, use some machine learning methods to uh, do the similarity, uh, to do the similarity prediction and the, the risk prediction between the projects uh, especially I am so interested in mm -hmm. the uh, machine learning on graph. I think it's more uh, suitable for uh, open source cooperation network. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you, can you repeat the last sentence? Mm, open source cooperation network. So yes, he's... Yes. He's trying to understand oh, how graph, people work. The network, the graph network. Yes. Okay. Um, Social corporate yes. network. So the, the report that was published um, two months ago, there was a blog on the chaos website. Yes, uh, yes, it's from my lab. That's from your lab? Yes. Yeah, and I don't X know lab. who is a, a Chinese name, but Frank? Was that, is he the guy uh, in your lab? Um, that was the English name he put on GitHub. Xiao Ya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? That's the same guy? Um, uh, I, I'm trying to go back. Is that Henry? Uh, <clears throat> going back. But so, to the the GitHub site. Yes. Here we yes. go. Uh, XLab 2017, mm. Open Digger. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Um, this is great. I love this um, because. I uh, I was very excited. I spent a lot of time looking at the report, and mm -hmm. I want oh, really. I more than I spent a lot of time looking at it. If I um, I'll throw something in here. Uh, Where's that chat? In the chat, that's the article I wrote about it. I did not write a lot about it. Just wanted to be a, it's a short, it's a column. I only write a little each week, but also because I, when I was writing it, it was, it was differences between the PDF and what was on GitHub. 
So I wanted to make sure I understood why there was differences, and it was because you were there were there was you were making changes and you were up you were updating things over time. Uh, the so in terms of question in terms of Sean, there was a lot of questions here that I just in terms of what they're doing in terms of updating things. There was a lot of questions that we could have answered. They could have answered that they just I that they already have the data sets to answer that I but they had they had different questions than I had. They looked at China, we could have looked at India, for example. Mm -hmm. Um and they're going to do, be looking at things next year. There I didn't necessarily like all the ways they did the graph analysis. Mm -hmm. Or actually, I liked a lot of the ways they did the graph analysis, and it was more math that I understood within an hour of reading. So I would have had to read a lot more, read it much more closely to understand mm -hmm. the math behind it. Um, I think, or maybe I would never understand the math. But I, uh, I, I but in graph graph theory is a bit different than a lot of the things we use here, for sure. But, yeah, so I, I mean, but I understand they explained it, the paper explained it pretty well, mm -hmm. what they did. I just was not well enough so that I did not, wasn't going to try to be a PhD, or, you know, a PhD counter argument against it. Um, but there were other things that they were doing that were, I would argue, about what they what they did argue in a good way it was well it was well written and argued but it's mm. also i think there was a lot there and i also think in terms of opportunity to give chaos exposure mm -hmm. there is uh, going to be a there should there could be a big fight between Europe, North America, oh, in the middle with North America and South and Asia on on the other side, in terms of um, open differences in terms of where the open source community is going to go in terms of economic outlook and mm -hmm. policies and politics because it's just not I mean, preferences for no preferences for or government not getting involved are much different in in East Asia, yeah, South Asia. I mean, the, different, in, for the, different reasons. But the regulatory but, requirements are different. Um, I mean, Europe has. I mean, involvement for different reasons, but it's just so mm -hmm. different. Um, yeah, there's definitely some local issues especially when it comes to analyzing contributors and understanding what way things are moving. Europe right. has a lot of pretty, you know, respectful privacy laws that well, don't exist in North America. Oh, so, yeah, mm. so the mm. privacy issues are big. And that's and privacy issues. How to deal with privacy issues, how to deal with English speaking issues. Those are mm -hmm. two, those are two separate issues. And how to deal with, um, bias because a lot of people who are GitHub contributors in, let's say, China mm -hmm. are the most educated and educated. And that's, there's a bias there itself. And so if you're the a less educated developer, but maybe you're not on GitHub, but you're still contributing somewhere else. So there's that, that there's 
there's those type of questions also. Um, uh, ooh. Oh yeah, okay, I saw it. Um, and, and with this, if you've never seen this before, problem with this database, this study, is that it, it will be better if you has more companies in it, but you have the only companies that it looks at are companies that are are nominated to go into the into their database. So you have to add if more companies add their name into their in YAML file, mm -hmm. it'll look at more companies. And so that's the limitation on this. Okay. And it has to be cleaned and yeah, it takes a long time to get all that email yeah. mapping stuff done. Um <clears throat> but and again this why I like chaos because you guys actually know what what the limitations are that and that's yeah. why I keep on referring everything back to you guys because I so I don't have to be the person who's always um shouting about the limitations I can say this is the this, this, this is the report this is a, this is great but here's the limitation and if you guys really want <laughs> To rely on something, talk to these guys because they spend hours upon it, dealing with it all the time. Um, that's that's why I've been advocate. That's why I've been a proponent since, since you guys started. Um, and that and this, again, this is awesome. But I don't want I don't want to basically have to do the ad hoc queries to, to find all the mistakes in everyone else's work. Um, and I hate ha seeing the report saying something's wrong and then knowing it's wrong. Um, uh, did I hijack your meeting? No, I mean, I think this is a workshop. Everybody gets to talk about what they want to talk about. And I've got a better idea of what you're working on. Uh, um, and I think that, you know, I think that Augur does fill a nice niche for the kind of problem you're looking to solve in terms of gathering a lot of data and having it in one place for analysis. I think the questions about dependencies and the questions about organizational affiliation are, I think, going to be, they're going to be areas where we're constantly improving, where everyone in this business of metrics is, that's building software is going to have to be constantly improving because neither of those universes will ever be perfect. And there's a lot of idiosyncrasy and data cleaning and mapping that go into um, effectively recognizing which companies are contributing and effectively recognizing all of the different email faces that we put on accidentally or otherwise when we contribute to open source. I think that, um, let's think, yeah. I'll yeah, there's, and yeah, so these, I'm not even going to deal with all these other, I'm looking at your spreadsheet and I can't oh, yeah. get all that. That's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of tools for sure. Um, yeah, the, um, you're, you you care mostly about the automated data collection. There's all these other things here with I mean, not automated data collection. I mean, machine generated data. I mean, we try to machine generate data, but when it comes to individuals and their email aliases, that often is something that a company will populate because they have the email aliases for all their employees, for example. Um, uh, what about a question that I've, I've been, what's the overlap between, couple, several years ago, I used to assume that most major projects that were, let's say Apache projects were being mirrored mm -hmm. to GitHub. Yeah. Um, is that still happening? Yeah, I think it is. I think I don't think I don't think Apache Apache's not given up on their their source control. 
apparatus. Yeah. I forget which which one it is. Um, but most of them are mirrored on on GitHub. And so and I think some of them have work occurring directly in them on GitHub. Um, what about GitLab? I don't know. Um, because what I have my impression has been that GitLab is used for a lot of development, but big projects are still being posted on GitHub. I think, I think, I mean, I don't have statistics on the industry, but my strong impression is that most of open source, like the a healthy majority of it is on GitHub. And, but if you, so, I mean, I, I have, I think GitLab is making, making, um, GitLab's definitely making an impact right now. Um, I mean, I would say that I, there, I'm, I'm aware for the first time this year in the last year of projects that are moving their infrastructure from GitHub to GitLab. And so obviously there's some kind of push underway and that's good. I, I have statistics. Uh, I don't have, I don't know if I trust the statistics in terms of market share. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, and, but the question is, is it, what are the, what part, part of their infrastructure is being used? Is it just for their, is it just for um, private, private, like, is it below the iceberg type of code? Is it a, like just the public mm -hmm. code? Is it like, just for, um, what are they doing with it? Um, because the idea is that basically most of the code work, the development work that's done is not being done in public mm -hmm. still. So um, in what case, like most of the, what do you say most uh, of the work? Uh, Google, most, most Google you know, Red Hat, they, they're the biggest producers of, of open source code. Okay. Most of the code that they write, net is not, it's never done in public. It's, it's, most of that's still in private repositories. Okay. I mean, I suppose, like, I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I, I I believe that, but I don't know what to do with it. Oh, I don't know what to do with it either. I and, but it, um, so the idea is basically thinking about it in terms of like Amazon, AWS, where people complain about AWS. The so the question would be is this is related to a chaos related to a chaos question is is AWS contribute back enough? To open source, hmm. that's a question. AW, people ask all people ask all the time: Is Amazon a good community, a member of the open source community? Um, how do you know? Are they do they are they participating in open source projects? Are they giving to open source foundations? Do they do X Y Z? What percentage of their developers are participating in open source projects. Um, what percentage of the de developers time are is being involved with open source projects. I, if you look at it, it's like 3% of their developers are contributors to open source projects. I, I'm making that I think that's what it was a couple of years ago. That's pretty damn low. Um, and, but, and, and then you look at it more, you say, well, that's because they're spending most of their time working on uh, pro other projects totally. Or I know painters pretty well. Take, maybe they're working on projects that are going to be go going to open source, but they're working on them internally. And then they're going to release the whole entire project to the public eventually. So there's different ways to look at that. And there's different ways to analyze that. Uh, and that's what that, that is that example is what Docker did. Docker was basically said, we don't want to collaborate with everybody until we're ready to release it, but we're going to release it to the public. I will say as a, as a project maintainer for, for Augur, mm -hmm. um, 
as a project maintainer for Augur. Um, the amount of work that's required to keep a project going in open source mm -hmm. is, you know, substantial. Yeah. And um, the, I don't see how, um, like, I, at the very beginning, we could not have, like, fully open, like, we were open sourced, we were in a public repo, but we were pretty low profile and just building it up. And that was a pretty small team, all things considered. And I think that's almost necessary to get like the first edition of something out the door. Mm -hmm. Like if you try to open source the thing when you're still defining the thing, it's really hard to communicate a contribution path. And I mean, I think, I think where we are now, especially with this summer of Google of Code, we've got, um, three developers who I think understand GitHub, understand Augur, and have identified some gaps that we can close in the in the feature robustness matrix related to these um, installation networks risk I, <clears throat> dependencies. <clears throat> that's a good lesson learned for projects that are being launched through foundations or startups even. If you, when the PR person makes a lot of noise to announce, make an announcement, there's going to be a big lag time. Mm -hmm. and, a lot, and there's going to be a lot of expectations and you just have to basically shut those out. There's, yeah. I mean, that's. No, no, I'm going to. Yeah. No, I've seen, I've seen projects and I won't say which foundations, but let's say some number of uh, foundations that support open source software have projects that are open sourced and have been sort of shepherded by those foundations through development. And what's ended up happening in a couple of pretty high profile cases in my experience is that somebody takes that open source code and then builds pieces on top of it that uh, forces you to require their company to even experiment with it. <clears throat> and I hate, I hate getting, like it's happened to me a couple of times now. So I'm very, very judicious about checking before I go down the rabbit hole of any project to try to figure out, am I actually gonna be able to build this? Is there like actual support for being able to run one of these things that this platform is supposed to run for me? Or am I forever locked out because I don't have access to some proprietary service that gives me a certificate or authorizes my um, my, my tokens? And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of weird open source stuff. Right. Um, cool. I'm going to get going. Um, I uh, Yeah, and this time is over, but I would like to um, I would like to set up some time with the Google Summer of Code students for tomorrow or later today. You do that. I'm going to hang up. I'm going to try to catch up with the rest of the chaos people later. I'm a, uh, and I'm just, and I'm busy hyping some surveys I did. Uh, so I did something with, I released my maintainer survey a couple days ago. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Bye All right. So there we go. Um,